Alrighty, getting close to midnight, so it means I better start working. I've had my little one hour nap at about 8.30 tonight on my new bed frame. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a mismatch. I have a single mattress and then I've put it on a double bed frame, but yeah, I'll get a double mattress soon. And people are probably thinking, wait, 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 what's going on? And the reason why I have that is because um, my anxiety and nerves and things like that make me a terrible uh, companion to sleep next to. So, and I mean for myself as well, it's like I feel like if there's any proximity around me, then I, um, I just can't sleep properly. I just twitch, turn, toss and feel all claustrophobic and I just have to run off and sleep on the couch or something like that but um, that's unfortunate, it's only a recent thing but it's um, probably stemming from my long-term anxiety issues so yeah, you, know, you have to adapt with what you can and thankfully I've got the room to be able to do that sort of thing alright so first up we have what's most likely going to be a 1502 battery replacement. We will take the board out just in case maybe there's an issue with the ISL but I suspect it's most likely going to be a battery. Strictly from the age alone it's uh, enough to sort of start uh, making it look guilty. Mind you, you know, it's hard to say. Um, there's an error on battery indicator as well which again tends to implicate the battery a little bit. We'll see, we'll see. We'll pull it out and have a look. Uh, let's put my glasses on, that way I can um, actually see what I'm doing. Oh, it, it's a very long-term sort of thing that I'm dealing with. It's, you know, most of my life I've had to manage anxiety issues, even before I even knew what they were. Like when I used to go to university, I would spend the first half of the day throwing up. From the angst, yeah, and I didn't know why. I was just, you know, what was I, 18, 19, and each morning I would get up. If I tried to eat anything, I'd just be up chucking. The only thing I could really eat was uh, dry crackers until about midday, and then from midday I was fine. Yeah, so anyway, it turns out it's um, yeah, all anxiety related in that particular case. I did go to the doctor a couple of times. Had various tests done, but in the end he just said, well, there's not much you can really do, you just got to try and relax. And uh, that's about, that was about the uh, sum of it for back in the early 90s when it came to that sort of thing. No, I'm actually the youngest child. There, I do have a sibling, an older sibling. But in fairness, I sort of behaved as if I was an only child and I behaved in a very solitary manner. I suspect my hearing has a lot to do with it. It's a lot easier for me to just get on with doing things myself rather than you know trying to listen for everything. I mean at school I applied myself very intensely. I wore hearing aids, sat at the front of the class, you know, did all the diligent student type things and I think you know by the time high school was finished I was pretty much worn out from all that and I just sort of uh, wanted to break from it. Yeah Steve K if only that was the case but um, I was not a, really a drinker at all about the only time I would say that I sort of pushed my luck when it came to drinking was when I was living in South Africa but outside of that, it's a bit too expensive to drink like that in Australia. I mean, I know some people manage to do it, but they certainly make sacrifices in their budget for it. I see, Josh, I'm the only one and have not and have not as severe anxiety as a lot sounds about. Yeah, I think it just comes, a lot comes down to person. There's certainly, you know, going to be some sort of crossover in factors. That's always what makes these sort of issues complicated, is that you can't just sort of say, oh yeah, we know why this is happening to you. Yeah, it can, sometimes it can just be a single moment in life that 
affected you in a way that you um, it was a life changing event even if it was only for a few moments Oh, they already thumbs down already? Hey, looks like our dedicated person is at it again. I, I dare say it's probably a bot. I can't imagine anyone truly being that dedicated to their cause that they would make sure they arrive here on time to thumbs down. Maybe it's Lewis. Yeah, it could be Lewis. I can see the amusement factor in that one. Okay, we don't take the screw out of this here until we take the board out. I think that's everything. Uh, DJ Craze, if you've not done any work on or replaced batteries on these sort of machines where they're glued down, it's not too bad. It can be a little bit daunting when you first approach it and that's understandable because you know, you hear the stories of people trying to get the batteries out and everything goes up in flames and so on and so forth but it doesn't really have to be that way I think the main thing is to get the right sort of tools for the job and for these sort of batteries the right sort of tool for the job is one of these very handy to have them you buy them in about, buy a box of 25 or something like that from AliExpress and just toss them out whenever they get a bit used up. And by used up, I mean what will happen is the, the fine edge here starts getting pitted. Yeah, it's easier to do this if we just take the speakers out as well. You don't have to take the speakers out, but it definitely makes it easier. Did you see Lewis is looking? Yes, I did. I was actually on the stream for the chat for a little bit, making snarky comments to Lewis, because yeah, that's what he pays me to do. Uh, I'll, I'll be very happy when we legitimately do get the board views and schematics. I know they have said they will release the schematics, and... As with promises of money, however, I'll only believe it when I see it actually in my bank account, or in this case, on the internet. It's not that I don't trust their intent, it's rather I don't trust the reality of the world to not deliver on these things. Particularly the board view side of it. Okay. By the way, uh, with the 1502 batteries, just lift up this central section so it disconnects from the um, two side of the tape that's under here, this sticky tape. If you don't do that, you'll find it very hard to get the spudger in and around. Morning, Greg. Okay, now, Sometimes you can just do it dry, you, know, you don't need to add anything on to this. I don't mind putting a little bit of 100% IPA just on the edge there. I should just, yeah, just cut right through that, like that, see? Each battery is going to vary slightly in terms of how difficult it's going to be to get out. It really depends on the day of the manufacturer, the what the dust levels were like, when the person actually pressed down on the pack well enough. It's uh, very variable. Sometimes the packs almost just fall out without you having to do anything. Other times it's a freaking nightmare to get them out. This one's about middle of the range.
getting snared up on that uh, plastic tape. That tape. There we go. Just remember, there are a couple of flexes floating around in, in nearby there, so don't get too overzealous. And there we go. It's all out. And actually, we didn't really do any damage to the pack. It's all just the adhesive that we're cutting through. And you shouldn't get too much separation of the pack out of wrap and the actual cells. So if I find out that this is actually not a battery problem, then I can easily just remove all that adhesive and put it back down and it's, it'll be all okay. I haven't damaged the pack in any way. Do you like the framework's features? Um, uh, yeah, now I'm going to get into trouble for saying things. Look, it's I think it's a great idea, having all the modules and things like that. I think practically or realistically, it's more of a feature for the sake of being a feature. If I was designing a laptop, I would probably instead rather just outright populate those ports by default. I think in terms of your port density, it's you know, obviously going to be fairly low. And although it's not so much of an issue anymore, the fact that it's all having to go through USB-C ports, so basically every external port is going to be a USB-C hosted connection. So like I said, it's probably not so much of a problem anymore because of the fact that you know USB-C pretty much covers it all. You don't really have performance or power restriction issues anymore with that. I suppose for me, I would have probably taken the middle ground and gone with the ports being on a you know on a flex or a daughter board or something like that. I feel like you can pretty much guarantee to cover your customer requirements for ninety nine percent of your customers if you have essentially what these MacBooks have. You know, you've got HDMI output, USB, S D reader, and you know, have a micro S D reader if you want as well. There another couple of USBs, headphones I don't know if you'd want display port because basically you just put USB C there and you're done. Particularly in this day and age. So I feel like it's a it's an interesting kit. But I think what a lot of people will find is that the fit and form of having those modules will become irritating after a while. Uh HDMI output. <laughs> Do they have an HDMI input module, do they? I haven't looked at what modules they've got available. But yeah, I feel like the fit and form will become an irritating factor as the machine wears on, just gets used. You'll start getting slop building up. And you know, it won't affect things electrically, but it will affect the feel of it. The 3.2 screen, which I accidentally thought was a 3.4 screen or a 4.3 screen, I think the 3.2 with the, I think it's, what is it, 1980 and 12.80. That's a brilliant screen. Definitely I'm happy to see that. Because we do need more vertical real estate. Quick question before going to replace an iPhone 6 screen. Ah, sure. The waterproof adhesive you can get for this. Any tips on applying it? Um, well, for the 6, they don't really have it. The 6S does. I don't have any tips, unfortunately, because I'll confess, I tell my customers that I don't bother with it. I know, I know, it's very wrong. But I haven't really found it to stop enough ingress to be worth it. It probably means the success. If it's the success, yeah, I mean, sure you can add it, but it really doesn't stop a lot because 
you've still got your headphone jack and everything else down the bottom uh, it's and the charge port are uh, not the charge port the sim card slot doesn't have an o-ring around or anything like that so you're still going to get a lot of ingress on that yes i know josh it's it's terrifying i don't do everything quite right it was very nice that you did that in french too le gasp moi Oh, no, no, monsieur. I'm just taking this tape off. Because if you don't take that tape off, or at least make half an effort to do it, when you put your new battery down, it's just kind of sit on top of that tape, and then everything around it isn't going to bond, and then your battery's going to start flapping around. I used to have a Sony Xperia. Oh, dear God. Yeah, I used to have one of those, too. The most common fault I fixed on the Sony Xperia Z uh, was people butchering that charge port. And that was a good example of someone having a technically nice idea of using the USB A um, USB Mini A standard versus what really happens because the trouble is with that particular standard is it's very easy to put a micro B connector in there upside down so it will take a micro B but it's very easy to also jam it in upside down so so many times I would get those phones in and their charge port would be butchered by people putting in the charger which was always going to be a, a micro B connector in upside down and it just shears off the connector Alright, so that's done. There's a little bit of residue, but that's not too bad. And at this point, I probably really should have checked the main board, but given the age and everything, I'm 99% suspecting it's the battery. I kind of did things a bit backwards here, but let's have a look at the main board anyway. <sighs> You watch, I'll find out. It's got a bad SMC. So this is a 2.68 gig machine. Okay, that's good. Just remove some of the fluffy fluffs, some of the dust bunnies. Now see, the Matrix 4 trailer came out today. And I gotta say, I'm cautiously optimistic that they won't completely fire truck this one. Kind of looks like they ditched all the going stupidness and just went back to a core story. So I guess we will see come Christmas time. I don't think I will spend the money to go see it in theatre or anything like that. But yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic based on the trailer. Just hopefully they don't, hopefully they just wrap it up with this one. Effectively like the original Matrix was, it was a complete story in itself. Rather than finishing on some sort of obscure cliffhanger or unknown. I think, okay, yeah, get your fourth installment, let's just wrap it up nicely. And make everybody happy with the complete and utter trucking that you did on two and three. Uh, this board is pretty much immaculate. If there was a s if there was the ability to have selectively have yourself selectively forget things so you could watch stuff again then certainly one of the movies I would love to watch again for that initial thrill would be the original Matrix in terms of series I would love to be able to watch Firefly and Futurama again from scratch with no memory that would be kinda nice
But you can bet your boots that selective memory thing will probably go wrong and I'll forget everything else but those things. Expect a new trilogy. Yeah, um, that's what I'm worried about, Civil Up. I'm worried that they will do what they did with the first, make it so it is a self-contained story, and then if it sells really well, they go, let's go and make another two. Kind of like Star Wars. My God, what a disaster Star Wars ended up as. I mean, it was already a cheesy franchise right from the start. I think a lot of people forget that when they saw that as kids, it seemed very impressive. But when you see it as an adult, it was <laughs> certainly full of cheese. But it was entertaining, for sure. And it was novel. But then, yeah, the subsequent... Uh, subsequent six, what was it, six more movies for Star Wars? Oh, what a disaster. Okay, what is going on here? Okay. They're going to make a hundred... Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, Michael, with the tiles, we are... Um, the deposit has been made 50% down for 150 square metres. That set us back about seven, about seven thousand five, seven thousand eight hundred odd dollars Australian. That's for the full price. You know, we paid fifty percent deposit of that, and hopefully, come Christmas time, we will have tiles. They've got to come in from overseas. So not much we can do about that. And they'll be coming on the slow boat. No way they're going to be flying those things in. Last episode would be called The Never Ending Story. <laughs> what I found interesting was that they were using the same music in the trailer, which is The White Rabbit, as what they did for uh, Sucker Punch. It's the same song. They've, they've remixed it slightly with a different uh, sort of tempo and such or whatever. But it's the same singer as far as I can tell as the one they used in Sucker Punch. Which is actually a pretty good rendition of the Dual Mouse. Not, what did I say? The White Mouse? I meant the Dual Mouse. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland stuff. Even though Alice in Wonderland doesn't really say too much about that. Okay, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm just putting stuff back together so that we can drop the new battery in and test it and make sure this actually works and that we haven't wasted all our time. Yeah, Greg, that was the frustrating thing is that they're in stock in Canada, the UK as well, and of course the US. But here in silly old Australia, they didn't have any, which is particularly frustrating because, yeah, like I said, we checked. We said, okay, look, we're going to need 150. Like I said, it was just a timing thing. They probably did have enough for 150 at the time. And then two weeks later, they sold out. It happens. <laughs> Can't say I was happy about it, but it does happen. But at least they did manage to source us some more. Noob question, what setting do you use DC power supply? Um, I use 18 volts and 5 amps max. It doesn't really matter too much because it goes through the ISL and just gets pumped up or down to whatever we need. What the heck, that's a 1466 battery, that's not the battery I want. Gee whiz. Right. That was a bit of a weird fit. Can get our Macos boot stick. I was going to say, there's no speaker connector, and I realised why, because I took the speakers out, which is correct. Uh, let's see. 
Yeah, I think we can go with this. Admin media, indeed. I got Jedi'd. Ah, kind of helps if I turn on the power supply, doesn't it? I see we don't even have the power supply on screen. Okay. How about that? That's better. Okay, so we're definitely charging. Greg M, you're the honorary member in Malwarebytes Forum. What do you do over there? What's the highest cycle count you've seen on a battery? I think somewhere in the around about 2,000 or so. Though I'm not sure if they differentiate between a full cycle versus just like little top-ups because maybe a, just a top-up from 85% to 95% is considered a cycle. I suspect that's why you get absurdly high numbers on batteries that probably wouldn't normally be specced at such figures. You hold their feet. <laughs> oh dear. Let's see. So we're at 98%. We've got a proper reading on the battery, so that's good. Now, the reason why I'm running Valley is I want to see if the performance is good. And it feels like the performance is good, so I think we're right. But if you have a bung battery, it can mess with the I2C lines going to the SMC, which subsequently can then make the machine run like complete crap. So this machine should get 30 odd, yeah, okay, 27, 28, 30, 40, yeah, so this is running good. Alright, so basically it was just bad battery, we've replaced it, it's good, shut down, charge rate's good. Thank you, Greg. Wonder what would cause the trackpad and keyboard to be either totally functional on boot up or not functional. What? Um, bad flex. That's a very common cause. Certainly one of the first things you check is a bad flex. And depending on the model, it can either be um, like on these ones, pretty sure the signals get channeled through the trackpad, so your keyboard can be fine, but if the trackpad's not, it'll also mess with your keyboard uh, data, so uh, like I said, model dependent. Okay, yeah, they've changed the way they do this cabling, I've noticed. They're actually using... Yeah, not sure if I approve or disapprove. I guess I don't get a choice, eh? The hardest part I find with installing these batteries is to not botch it up installing it. And what doesn't help is that they're connected together with this top layer of plastic. Now, it's supposed to help you, but, well, quite frankly, I find 90% of the time it's actually quite the opposite of being helpful. It ends up doing things up, misaligning such as we're seeing here, this end battery, and then by the time you pull off the that top layer, you've applied pressure onto the two-sided adhesive and it jams it into the position you really don't want it to be in. So, not so helpful. 
This should actually just come off like it was just a statically attached cling wrap type thing, not frickin' double-sided tape. Like. And they say, don't remove the top layer until you've fully assembled the battery. And it's like, I can't assemble the battery into the machine unless I remove this annoying layer of... There we go. Ach, niemand. Yeah, tech hobby. It is. Uh, it makes you feel that way, doesn't it? It's like, okay, now if I bonded this tightly to the chassis, we should be right. But you know, it's probably not going to. Yeah, this is just way, way too difficult to remove. It is actually difficult to the point where it's causing the cell packaging to lift slightly. You don't want that. It's not super critical, but you don't want that. You shouldn't have to have that. Hey, Toastek. Alright, now where's that pesky little screw? There is one screw here in this for the battery. It sits in this corner. And it is not like any other screw in your MacBook, so do not lose it. You will not find a suitable replacement anywhere other than another MacBook. As in another one of these ones. It's sort of like, it's a coarse thread, plastic type thread screw. And like I said, just, you don't find it anywhere else. So if you lose it, it's gone. Hey JCT. How's it going over there? Fortunately, at least, thus far, it seems like it's been a rudimentary battery replacement. I say thus far because it's not fully assembled and I haven't put it through all the testing I want to. And we all know how these things can turn around and bite you in the backside. Nice and hot in Pretoria. You can't say Pretoria anymore, can you? Aren't you supposed to say Swanee? I wouldn't even know how to ask for my way around in you know over there anymore because all the names have changed. I mean that's not a problem per se, but it's just an example of the fact that you go away for a little while and everything gets upended on you. Okay, it's a little Phillips head. This is this is another quirky screw in the 1502 in this particular model is you've got a Phillips head screw that ties down the heat sink. Okay, so only the city centre is called Schweiner. Oh, okay, well, things you learn every day. So the great area is still considered as Pretoria. That's nice. The company that I worked for when I was over in South Africa probably built about a good 50-60% of Pretoria. It was uh, Stocks and Stocks. They're a nice company to work for and unfortunately I got there just as they were doing exceedingly well in terms of their budgets, their jobs and stuff like that. 
And then they absolutely butchered everything. They expanded out into whole new different areas. They did things like buying up golfing shop chains, you know, chain shop, uh, chain stores, and stuff. Um, scuba diving. They went out all over the place. And then 12 months later, oh, everything's wrong and it just collapses. So it's pretty sad that you have this company that have been around for many decades and they uh, achieve great financial success and then it goes to their head and they collapse. That was fun sitting in those uh, meetings, just sort of listening to the various board members and stuff try to placate the understandably very uncertain staff members and just listening to them give out the ever so normal reassurances. Oh, we're just restructuring, it's going to be okay. Yes, man, no, no, no big problem. And you know, really, that it's a case of grab everything you can and run because this thing, this ship's going down. And sure enough, it did. They did at least manage to spin off the hotel game park division to become, um, oh, geez, what did they call themselves after that? Legacy, Legacy Hotels, that's it, yep. Tech Hobby, five pound, thank you. Any recommendation on decent tweezers that won't break the bank? Since Brexit hacker is almost, whoa, okay. Um, for me, my tweezers, I gotta be honest, the last batch that I've been pretty happy with came from um, Union Repair, but they are branded ones. God, where are they? I it. Okay, I'll be right back. I'll go get them. Talia, you shouldn't be in this yard. You okay? You look a bit spaced out. Oh, what is it? You want to get out? All right. All right, I've left a... We've got a kitty cat that we need to let back out into the greater yard. And I cannot, for the flippin' life of me, find... God damn it. How can I have lost them? I had like five or six boxes of them. Now I can't find a single one. Of course, that's just to be expected because, well, yeah, it's normal. Oh wait, maybe I've got them in here. In the wrong box. Yep, in the wrong box. Alright, I'll just show these quickly and then I've got to go and deal with Talia who's in here inappropriately. Okay, so these are the ones that I use a fair bit now. I don't know if they're still available at Union Repair or whatever, but they do have the nice um, aspect where the tips are double ground down, so it gives you that extra fine control, which is great for the iPhones and things like that. Now the only thing is they don't have the strength to be able to move things like the camera connector and a couple of other things. So if you really want some durability, then these ones here I have not been able to find replacements for. But the closest things I can come up with are the Vetus um, Superfines. I'm pretty sure I've got... But even the Vetus Superfines don't quite have that strength in them. What's sad is these were these were just cheap generic ones that I got way before I even cared about what I was using for tweezers. Yeah, this is them. 
Yeah, so, yeah, these are the Vetus Superfines. Oh, wait, no, these are the Lindstrom. Okay. Um, word out, with the Lindstrom tweezers, I don't recommend them. They are very f nicely manufactured, but they're very soft, and you will damage the living daylights out of them every time you use them. Yeah, I, I bought a bunch of the Lindstroms, and I regret that. That was a fair bit of money that really I didn't shouldn't have spent. Okay, so yeah, these are the Vita Superfines, which is the SSJP. That's the marking. So they're very similar in length and very similar in taper, but they don't quite have the strength, the thickness on the side when it comes down to the taper. But yeah, look around, try some eBay ones. Oh, these also, complete junk. These titanium tweezers, they... If you've got a feather touch, and you can, you can hold things extremely lightly. If you're a person who doesn't clutch your pencil when writing and you're trying to break it at the same time, then maybe these will work for you. But I found them to be actually very frustrating to use because as soon as you start to try and clamp down on something to hold that wire or whatever, the tips just bend away. The thing with titanium is that while it's a very durable, tough material, it is not a material that has a lot of actual, um, how can I want to say, um, ten, uh, not tensile strength. It, it flexes a lot, put it that way. It's got a lot of uh, flexibility in it. So yeah, I bought those thinking they were going to be great, but they turned out to be junk. And yeah, these cheap eBay super finds ended up being the big winners. And the Lindstrom's again, expensive junk for our particular purpose. I think that needs to be made clear is that for the work we do, it's quite hard on the tips of um, tweezers. You need something that's got a bit more hardness in the metal, and the Lindstrom's just do not have that. They're mostly quite soft. There may be some hardened versions of them, but yeah, I, look, I've got about three or four of them here I tried, thinking it was just maybe a bit of bad luck, and no, nah, it's all a waste of money. I see I've got a tool one here. The grind on this tool one is all whacked. It's uneven, so I don't know. I'm not sure how it compares to the Vetus. I'm going to stick that one in there. But yeah, these in easy ones with the double ground tips, they're really good. I'm going to have to sort out Taylor in a second, but I'll just have a compare of these tips. Uh, where's my other good tweezers? Did I just throw them back in there? In the end, though, you know, you're going to spend like $20, $30 on various types of tweezers that you can get, and out of them you might find something that you can use. In regards to the various shapes of tweezers, some people do prefer the offset position ones. But I find I keep, now that I've got these ones here, this, you can see what I mean by that double grind. Now that I've got these, I don't tend to go for the offsets quite so much. The only other pair of tweezers I use are the self-clamping ones, and you use them for just holding pieces of wick when I'm doing hot air. Yeah, no, these things, what is he, Goot TS-16s or whatever. Yeah, these ones here. And I just use those for holding pieces of wick. Having the serrated tips on it probably kind of helps the heat transfer not get too aggressive. Alright, so these are my big butchering brutal ones, which I probably should realign again. And these are the ones I have no idea what the brand they are or anything, but they're the rough equivalent to the Vetus. But you can see what I mean by how sturdy these ones seem compared to these ones. I guess to be fair, I've kind of ground those tips back about to probably about equivalent of here now. But, no, it's like I said, it's all a matter of trying it out. These I like because I can put pressure on 
when I'm holding a wire and they don't flex out. Whereas these ones, okay, admittingly there's a bit of a, a bit of a defect there. Let's see, everything I've got has that defect because I abuse my tools. It's very hard to actually straighten tweezers because what you straighten them with tends to make them bend back out. You kind of have to, okay, so we've got that. And what's the other one? Oh, these are the okay. We'll have a look. These are the tool ones. Yeah. See what I mean by there's a, f a fair amount of difference in the grind on them. So you've got a very thick right hand side here in this particular orientation versus a thin left hand side. That's very annoying because you then start to have to make sure you've got things orientated correctly. So anyway, so yeah, personally. I find these, however the heck you pronounce, Kion Lee or whatever, I find them to be a pretty damn good compromise overall. Good for, you know, good strength, doesn't flex out, good precision on picking up little tiny parts, even um, 0105s will be fine with this, well worth the money. Yeah. Okay, I've got to go and deal with Talia because she's going to start fretting out. And I shouldn't be too long, so give me a minute or two. All right. Turns out, just as I'm going to go let them out, Alita happens to be woken up, and she let them out. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go take a photo of something. Upload this. Hmm. Now I just got to check.
Steve K. Uh, tweezers made out of hacksaw blades or something like that. I presume they were hacksaw blades. Would make very good tweezers. They've got that spring, but they're also extremely durable. Uh, here we go. Um, I'll show you what I had to stop and take a photo of. <clears throat> this is um, this is micro coming up. Let's see where it is. I don't know how people can do this so quickly in live streams. Yeah. So I walk past the laundry and I see Micro here. Take note that he's got his mouse with him. He takes this mouse with him pretty much wherever he goes and just happens to have some Christmas baubles flying around. We must empty out a box for something, probably to save a snake or something like that. But yeah, dear little Micro with his mouse. Kind of really nice being able to see things like that around the house. Apparently it's something that, uh, what do you call it, it's something that uh, tuxedo cats seem to have a predisposition for, as in being possessive with a particular object. Yo, he hasn't, we've really got to do something about preparing for the day that Mousy either falls apart or gets lost, genuinely lost, and it's very hard. I have, Constantly been on the lookout, but I still have yet to find an actual replacement for that mouse. It's sad to think at some point there was probably tens of thousands of them. Simply because, you know, they were manufactured. It was manufactured as a cat toy with a stick and a piece of elastic. And the mouse was on the end of that elastic. And yeah, so we just took it off from the elastic and that was his toy. And he has had that since he was probably six weeks old. And he is now, well, he's over eight years old now. So yeah, he has had that a long time. So as you can imagine, we really don't want to lose it. Hey, Lewis. Hey, Lewis, did you see Micro? Hmm. Yeah. Well, if anyone does see a mouse, I do have proper pictures of the mouse. But if you ever do see it, let me know. So, let's see. There you go, Lewis. Here's Micro. Micro, the cat that actually managed to get you to pay attention to what I was trying to say. At least a bit kind of like, you know, when you get distracted by um, the mid-range area on people that you're talking to if they're of the opposite gender. Yeah, so that mouse, if anyone sees something that looks comparatively similar, then let me know. By the way, after this, we are going to be start building the open board data boards because my supply of 80 tiny 45s arrived. And it's actually a bit of a funny story. I'll just bring this up now. I ordered 25 of these 80 45s. And, of course, as you know, we botched up the previous order and we got the TTSOPs instead of the SOICs. Now, 25 is that many. For some reason, they sent me 62. So, <laughs> there's quite a few extras there. I'm going to have to work out... I'm probably going to have to call them up and say, look, you know what, you've sent me too many. I don't think my personal morales, um, ethical standards can actually tolerate me not sending them back to them. Okay, and yeah, we've got plenty of circuit boards. And by the way, on the, I don't know if I showed it the last time, but on the back of it, we do have a test area or a prototyping area. I don't know if anyone's going to actually use any of that, but someone asked of it for me, uh, from me, and since it was just a ground plane flood fill, it was no drama to break it up into little squares. I don't know what pictures I've used there, but yeah, it works. So, anyway, so yeah, we'll be building a few of those tonight since we finally got the microcontrollers. Hallelujah.
even if they sent me too many of them. But yeah, now I've got a ethical pickle to deal with. Do I let them know that they sent me too many? Or do I keep them? How much, what, how much the way the micro kitty? Um, he's probably around about five and a half, six kg, I think. Yeah, if we do, as admin said, if we do get a replacement one, we'll have to just sort of like do a migration transfer. It may not work, but it's worth a shot. We have tried many other different types of stuffed toys of similar size and whatnot, but he's always keeps going back to that mouse. And it is starting to get to the point where it's fraying. Um, and I'm not going to be able to stitch it back together so well anymore because it's the actual material now that it's becoming too thin. Alright, let's get this lid on this 1502 and get it out of here. Now, and as luck would have it, it's up there. <coughs> I don't think I've... Oh, I've got a... Um, I've got a 165 I need repairing. It's the second board that I bought from one of the local places that I'm not allowed to normally buy boards from. You know, backdoor type stuff. Unfortunately, it's a bit liquid damage, so I sort of didn't bother with trying to fix it the other night. But as it was, we still ended up a dud that other night with the... Okay, why is that not sitting down properly? Have to examine that. Can't just go forcing these things. If it doesn't fit, please don't try and force it. Back it out, have a look, see what's going on. Okay, what's going on here is this plastic isn't quite sitting. There we go. If you force it, you may cause irreparable damage to things that, well, you're just going to have to fork out a lot of money for to replace. Hey Promo, how's it going? I have a kind of a rude question already. Well, it is the internet after all. can be interesting though, some people, what some people consider rude, other people consider to be entirely normal. Hey, nuts and proud. Well, uh, we don't use blood strips, we, we have the lance and the glucose meter. Or is that what you're meaning? As opposed to like a ketone strips and stuff like that. Don't have flexible view, but I want to ask, does OBD have diode readings for T1 and U4000? Uh, T1? What's T1? Which board? Mm. Open board data will be available to everybody even beyond flexboard view. Once I have finished doing the website and everything like that, you'll be able to simply query your board and it will bring up all the available, all the available data for each board. Uh, what glucose meter? And uh, it's a quick test. Uh, I forget what it, which one it is again. All right, this is working fine. Came up straight away. Yep, no dramas. That's fixed, and we already know it charges. So, very happy with that. That can go in the out queue, which is nice. Free up another slot around here. Getting frustrating not having enough slots. 
Lewis, if you're still around, about how many of your slots in the store are filled up with jobs that have been there greater than three months? Kind of curious. That's probably not a statistic you actually know anymore because I imagine you're too busy with everything else. But it's quite a problem here where I just, I, yeah, I clear out slots and before I know it, it, they fill up again with dud jobs and I've even gotten to the point where I buy out dud jobs just to get them out of my slots. Uh, 00923, okay, so that could also be the 2, um, what is it, 239 on that one, I think. Let's have a look, let's have a look for a promo. Let's board view, schematics, file. I have a feeling it's probably going to be on the 239, so U3900. Hmm. All right, there is, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of data points in there, open board data. It's not everything, but there are a good number of them. I mean, to be fair, a lot of these pads aren't even connected. So, yeah, you can see these values here, you know, one six, one six, whatever. It looks like a busier chip than what it really is. Uh, yeah, but you got to realise that you know you've got all these ground pins and then you've got all these unconnected pins. So I just realised I should actually make it that it doesn't bother displaying the NC pads, the network names. That clear up some space. Yeah, things to do in the future. U4200, I'd imagine U4200 would have similar. Uh, let's see, get to show, alright actually U4200 doesn't have a lot, it's only got this bottom corner. All these other ones uh, have not been done, so the trouble is I don't have a 239 board that's functioning. So I can't add any data to it. But yeah, there's data there. It's just not 100% complete yet. Yeah, Joseph King. Confusing Lewis is sort of like what I wake up each day to try and achieve. So if I can do that, then that makes me a happy man. You can be sure he's going to turn around and do something equally as vile to me. Uh, right. Okay, so we've got an Apple FRU board here, field replacement unit, for those who aren't sure what that meant. Which means it's a board that has died in the past, gone back to someone who is blessed by Apple to fix the boards, and then been given another life. Only to then get liquid damaged again by the looks of it, and die yet again. So what is this, this is a Lazarus board? Uh, let's go to the overhead so people can actually see what I'm doing. Put the chipmunk in. I can be fairly sure nothing useful is going to happen here. Oh wow, it actually boot current's okay too. Oh, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. The CPU we're getting a little bit warm. We'll see if we get a green blink. If we do, then all we've probably got to worry about is the backlight. I think. Huh? The board is alive take that people Rossman who say that it only takes one drop and destroys all MacBooks to be fair he's correct if you put a drop of liquid in the right place you can destroy a MacBook or any computer for that matter but there's a difference between the ability to do so and it actually happening and this board as you will see shortly has got a lot of liquid damage on it and it's still kicking and doing work 
Okay, so there we go. Completely corroded away backlight output. Very messy, very messy. Geez, even the SMC section is a bit dodgy. 342 is a bit dodgy. JTAG has got corrosion in it. Man. It's got an Apple sticker on it. I mean, come on, it's just getting worse and worse. F FRU stamp. How's this board even alive? USB power switches botched up. Yeah, green blinky is nice because it shows you that the CPU is doing some talking. And also, oh look, even that there, what is that? That's um, Thunderbolt or something? Who knows? Backlight chip is botched. SMC is botched. Come on, this, this board is basically a great big fat middle finger to people like Lewis. Or people saying that they get destroyed so easily. This is a great big fat middle finger. Saying, we will not go quietly into the night. But instead we'll go into your wallets and take your money. <laughs> oh look, even that cap has been manufactured in a bad year. It's when they did the reflow of that, they got that wrong, and it's think of all the electrons that are trying to get on that, and they miss the step, trip over, and they spill out into the ram there. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's still going, still trucking, even with tripped over electrons. Yeah, all right. I think this board actually deserves to be cleaned up and made to good work good again. Ah, bug P. Yeah, okay, bug P is a real problem. Will the CPU ever heat without the heat sink? Not usually. If you leave it there for too long, it's going to get upset and it'll throttle back, but it shouldn't destroy it. It's not like it's one of the um, AMD 1 gigahertz chips from year 1999-2000. Would it make sense to open a MacBook and confirm? No, um, it wouldn't actually because, I mean, it, it might help. I won't deny that. It will help. But the trouble is, with a lot of the coating things, you've still got to be able to get connectivity through your connectors. And there's still going to be voids and flaws in the covering. So it's basically better to not bother with it and you know, just live with the risk. But this whole backlight section needs to be redone. Uh, D da oh man, yeah, I'm gonna struggle saying your name properly, D Damaris. Can I just keep calling you Damaris? <laughs> By the way, um, how are you going with the? Um, it was the Athlon ones, or the first ones that really love to die on leaving the heatsink off. How are you going with the board outline for GenCAD? By the way. I mean, back then, the Intels, even though it was P4s, you know, that gets super hot, but they wouldn't die. But the AMD Athlon, you leave that heat sink off for a poofteenth of a second. Oh, sh I can't say that anymore. Um, for a smidge of a second, yeah, it's dead. Bang, it's gone. You just wasted a $1,000 CPU. Hey, Asimoth. I blame my father for such terrible statements. Alright, so we're going to... I'm just going to slowly get this off. I don't want to cook it up too much. We're just going to go along and strip off everything that we don't need that's damaged. Actually, yeah, uh, sorry, you're right. I'm pretty sure it was the Duron, you're right. For some reason I was thinking the Athlon came first.
Okay, guys, so we didn't have to melt everything. We didn't have to destroy it like a madman. Just a bit of gentle swaying heat. And pick off the parts and touch the circuit board. That's really hot. Yeah, oh. Yeah, this is pretty much a full wipe on this backlight section. Because everything's up to temperature, it's very easy to pick off bits. And we're going to take away the USB power switch as well. Struggling a little more with that one. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we'll take the display port switch as well. There we go. Yeah, Joseph King, it was, it was fun to watch if it was someone else suffering for it. It was definitely not fun to watch if it was your own. That was, that was just a cry. Yeah, you'd cry if it was your own. I think Lewis has left the chat because he was offended by the fact that this board even exists. And I wasn't willing to play into his universal Apple hatred. By the way, anyone who's only just joining, Lewis and I get along just fine. Because we've never actually met in person. So when I when I was saying early Athlon, I should have specified and was rather referring to their one initial or their flagship one gigahertz processor when it came out, which really took the punch from Intel. Intel was a little bit pissed off about that, but yeah, and then they fumbled with that damn P4. That P4 was so terrible. In theory, it was great, but. In theory, the Itanium was also great, and it was a complete disaster. That was a bad, a bad example of saying, we don't need engineers as much as we used to, we can just use software people instead to write better compilers. And as expected, the better compiler never eventuated for that, or at least not reasonably soon. It's just too hard to make that sort of prediction to keep the pipelines full. Um, yeah, IP, uh, not 2581. IPC 365 I do, but not 2581. Have you got a spec for 2581? Because if you can send it to me, I can write up an in reader for it. Because certainly the IPC 356 or 365, I never remember which one it is. Um, yeah, I've done that one in Flexboard View, but I had a spec for it. But I don't have a spec for the one you're talking about. Oh yeah, this board's definitely getting ultrasonic, there's no question about that. Lewis will never update his software. The only way that software is going to get updated is when I get Paul to commandeer his machine and install it that way. And Lewis will just simply one day go back and go, hey, it's working better now. I don't know if I'm going to have to put the extra effort into producing a compatibility visual mode that makes it look like the old version just to trick him, but yeah, I think we'll be right. He'll get used to it. And if he doesn't, he'll just yell at me on live stream, so it's, it's cool. It's all good. There's no way it goes bad for me. Alright, so these pads have definitely completely been eaten out there's no resurrecting them so what we'll do is we'll just simply run a wire from over here onto the pins for the connector I don't really need to I'm not going to need to fill in this with any UV 
or anything like that. It should be safe. Famous last words. Oh, Joe, don't forget HP. HP really just shot themselves in the foot something bad when they signed on for Intel and they dropped their own architecture. The HP UX architecture was... <laughs> it had a much better uh, chance of succeeding than the Itanium. Now, by the time the Itanium 2 came out, it was certainly a much better implementation of their idea. To be fair, they kind of shortened the pipeline a bit, I think. Or at least allowed you to... Um, a bit like the... Hyper-threading, yeah, they could have a shorter version. But the damage was done, the boat had sank, just like the Titanium. The Titanium? <laughs> Titanic. Yeah. Uh. Oh, yeah, for sure, Joseph. I mean, in a realistic, pragmatic business sense, Lewis yelling at my software is definitely one of the best things he can do for me. And he knows that, and that's why he does it. And, you know, it's good. It works out well for us. You know, he has someone to yell at, who he knows usually doesn't take offense. And I have someone with lots of followers, and he's an influencer. So, you know, when he talks about my products, it's one of the rare cases where the exposure is actually worth the price of the product for me. Many times when people say they'll give you exposure or you know spread your name around, it's completely worthless. But when it came to Lewis using Open Board View after using Landrex and then ultimately switching over to Flex Board View, that that's marketing I couldn't buy. I just can't buy that sort of authentic marketing. Because when he's yelling at it, you can tell he's not being contrived. He's genuinely yelling at it. <laughs> oh, I hate these connectors without the dimples on them. Damn it, why do they keep sending me stupid screen side ones? Hey, Rilla. Why not implement auto update? I did have an auto update, but in all honesty, I think. If I had an auto update facility, if I left that on there, that would probably cause more hatred and actual legitimate hatred than not having it. Yeah, House Moth, exactly. Yeah, you, you can go on the long list of people who have tried to get me to give them free copies. <laughs> I know, I know, you're only joking. Um, if you do try to ask me for a free copy and things like that, please understand that I am going to tell you to use Open Board View. Because Open Board View, particularly if you are not doing it as a business, Open Board View is perfectly good for doing this sort of work. It's a little slower because you have to do the manual searches between the PDF and the Board View. But it works. It does the job. Pionov does a great job keeping an update. There's a few other people now off adding bits and pieces to it so it's great and if you are a commercial entity then you should already be making enough money to be able to afford flexboard view so I can sleep at night perfectly well charging what I do for the software you've had your science since 2017 eh? has it been what? no it hasn't been running that long has it I think Open Board View. I thought it was around. I don't know. Okay, now people are sitting here thinking, my god, this guy is terrible doing soldering. Look at those horrible pigeon crap welds that he's doing on there. And you're absolutely right, they are horrible. But that's because I'm going to use hot air assistance to make them much better. Have you tried using the pre cut software, uh, copper stickers? I um, have seen them. And I kind of have a slight interest in more for iPhones, not for MacBooks. For MacBooks, I don't really see a need for them. 
MacBooks are already such large connect uh, pads and things like that that you don't really need those assistive pre-cut ones. But certainly for iPhones, I can see them being very useful. I haven't bought any, but they do look interesting. And this is what we call assistive heat soldering. See that? See? That's pretty much a factory perfect type connection. All you're doing is just adding heat to the board so that the board doesn't steal it away so much from the tip of the soldering iron. And that's using a micro pencil. And you don't need a lot of assistive heat, that's only 250 centigrade. So it's not enough to melt things, but it is enough to stop the board becoming a great big nuisance. Uh, Travis, I didn't want to get too too ahead of myself though because I've still got to do all these pins so you never know this may end up being less than factory shortly I'm running out of flux Joseph, I am going to ignore that. <laughs> That's my fur child you're talking about. <laughs> okay, I've inadvertently bent a pin there. Fortunately, it's not too bad. I kind of want to bend this pin back, but I also kind of don't want to stuff everything up. I'm kind of thinking that must have been bent as it was originally, because that took way too much force to push it back. Anyway, that's... It's an NC by the looks of it anyway. So now we've got to focus on our backlight output. I might see if I can capitalise on that little smidge of copper that's sitting at the underside of the pad. It's there. Alright. Probably pushing my luck to blob it. Well have a look, see if I can just reach it or not. Who's responsible for coding open board view? The um, open board view group is responsible for it. So if you go to the GitHub page, you'll see all the members of the Open Board Group, uh, Open Board View Group. Predominantly, it, well, it used to be me and Pionov, and uh, before that, it was people like Pathmath, Matt, and Pionov. And then after I told you the story yesterday, I basically came in like a bull in a china shop and commandeered everything but now it's predominantly peeling off but there are more people contributing which is nice to see yeah this is not going to take see if I try to bring the solder up there it momentarily wants to form a blob but then the blob very quickly retreats away so I can't depend on it what I might do is I can put a mesh in there and that might work Hey, Sabatino.
One thing I do find useful is to have, take a pair of tweezers, cut the fold, you know, the joined end off, and then you'll have two very nice little probes. And it makes it easier to do this sort of work that we're about to do. That you can just like, grab one end, and naturally, of course, I'm making an absolute butchery of it. Uh, I've got a kink in that wire there, I'm going to have to break that. But yeah, having these sort of single-ended probes, it's very handy. I think what I'll do is I'll solder that up in there and then fold it down. Because right now I'm just simply making a complete stuff up of it. Now, Pionov, you still do quite a bit on it, and you sort of manage it overall in terms of, you know, permitting updates and things like that. And Paul is really butchering this. No, I'm going to have to start that again. I've completely lost my mojo on that piece of wire. The wire and I did not agree. I'll try the other end. To be fair, you know, Pionov has been emotionally damaged by my software coding. And yeah, that's a that's a price uh, that's damage that will take him many years to get over. I forced him to have to deal with my horrendous code. Ach niemand fire truck. I need to change the angle on this. Why am I such a useless solderer right now? Yeah, I should go and apply for a job at New York. I don't think I need a third arm, Greg. I think I just need a brain. Alright, that's what I was trying to get to. Not that. Not that. Damn it. <sighs> the stupid thing is, I actually took the wrong path. I really should have come up this side, but it's going to have the required effect anyway, so we'll just go with it. And what I might do is I'll see if I can reflow that. Let's see if it settles down into a better position. It's definitely not my best work by any measure. Obviously we don't want to heat this up too much because we don't want the plastic to melt. But given that we've got leaded solder here in this particular instance, we should be able to get it to reflow before the plastic melts without trying too hard. Trying hard, Paul. There it goes. Come on, you can do it. 
Yeah, that's what I wanted. And naturally it's all out of focus, damn it. Uh, one planet, one people. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I can't speak up. Yeah. No, I definitely can't speak up for cans. I can curse a little bit, and that's about it. Alright, time to put on the other parts that we need. Doesn't matter if it's hidden by the cable, I'll know it's dodgy. And one day I'll be offended by my own work. And I'll probably blame it on someone else. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's about right. I speak enough to get into trouble. Oh, you got to be kidding me. The one part I wanted and I've taken it away. What is this? Conspiracy, that's what it is. Yeah, I just got it right. I can speak a little bit of Afrikaans. Bitter. Oh, you're from... Oh, you're not allowed to say that. You cannot say that anymore. Oh, ma, we've got some hostiles in the group. Whereabouts from Zimbabwe are you? I haven't spent a lot of time in Zimbabwe, but I did get to Umtali. Um, um, yeah, Umtali is as far as I got. Then took a look down in Mozambique the border. Are you from Harare? It is sad what happened to Rhodesia, Mozambique, Ah, oh, not Mozambique, um, well, Mozambique's its own drama. Zimbabwe, you yeah, know, it was... The amount of damage that has been done to that country, which should have been the breadbasket of the, the whole South African, Southern Africa continent. Yeah, it's just sad to see what happened to it. It certainly had a lot of really good prospects, but then I suppose that often is the case. And then humans get involved and it just goes all pear-shaped. Left Zimbabwe, Kariba. I don't know that place, I'm sorry. I apologise for not knowing it. It can get hard. You travel around a fair bit for work and stuff, but ultimately, unless you're directed there for a job, you tend to miss a lot of places. I was very happy to get posted out to Namibia a few times, up to uh, Swakopmund and Vintuk. Swakopmund is one of those very strange places on the planet. You, you got this town that's by the Atlantic, freezing cold in the Atlantic by the way, don't ever do stupid things like take a jump in there, <laughs> even if it doesn't matter how much your friends are telling you it's going to be okay, don't do it. Um, yeah, so you got this town and it essentially has to be constantly swept because the desert is coming up and trying to consume it the whole time. Mother work for Ian Smith. Oh wow, okay. That, um, that is quite a bit of, uh, bit of a connection there. I said it could have gone so very nicely, and unfortunately it didn't. Uh, I guess that's a sadly common theme. There we go, someone's going to claim the birthrights. But yeah, you're right, Joseph. Power corrupts almost all the time.
think one of the nicest little restaurants, I, well, I guess it's probably not that little anymore, oh, wasn't that little, when I was driving into Zimbabwe, there was a, um, there was this beautiful restaurant, it was a trout farm as well, I think, or it had trout farms, uh, what was it called, I think it was called Rhodes Hotel, and I got there in the morning, I had breakfast, and then before I knew it, it was sort of uh, morning tea time, so I had morning tea, and then it was lunch, and I had lunch, and then I didn't leave that place until nightfall. And for some reason, I was eating constantly, or felt like it, but I wasn't really getting full, like, you know, I wasn't thinking, oh man, I can't eat another thing. It was just like, bring me more food, bring me more food, this is the greatest thing ever. I did also go to the... Oh, sh truth, my memory's really given up on me here. What's the famous hotel in Zimbabwe by around about the Victoria Falls area? The Cheetah Hotel or something like that? I think it's Cheetah Hotel. Oh, damn it. Royalty's been there and everything. And it was okay, but I'd sooner go back to the Rhodes Hotel. check for updates button not doing that not doing that for Lewis Lewis would only abuse such a feature like that and quite frankly I hate to say it but it's true that his behavior with Flexboard View tends to dictate how I roll out things to everybody else I take Lewis's use of Flexboard View as being sort of the standard I have to attain One plane, one people. Work the gold mines in South Africa after living in Zimbabwe. Okay. What, in Johannesburg or some other area? Hmm. Alright, we've still got to put that cap back there and... What else? Oh, and the fuse. Got to put a fuse back there apparently. Who would have thought I'd need a fuse? Oh, Vulcan. Okay. Is that, um... It's not near Potch, is it? I know the name, but I don't exactly recall where it was. It's not near Potch, is it? Well, when I say Potch, I mean Potch for some... Oh, Orange State. Okay, I'm way off, way off. Okay, no, I never got into that area. Explains why I have no real recollection of it. Because I was mostly working with stocks and stocks, with their, wherever they were constructing things, and then where they had their um, various hotels and game parks. Aus Achtnima. And I don't think we... I think we might have had a little resort in the Orange State. I don't recall, so though. Damn it. I didn't get down to Durban much either. There was a resort down there, uh, Le Cote d'Azur, but I didn't get to do much down there. Oh, you're kidding me, this one's got none of those parts? Most of the time I spent far too much time at uh, the Palanisberg, 
which some of you watching will know indirectly that's where Sun City is or of course as we used to very cliche-ish um, we'd call it Sin City but yeah it's Sun City although the resorts that I were at were not actually in the Sun City complex they were outside of it along the other side of the mountain but it's all in the same area and we used to always go to Sun City if we had time That said, when you work in the hotel industry, you really don't get a lot of time to yourself. You essentially, you just run flat out until you burn out. That's pretty much it. So I'm sure other people who've worked the hotel industry can know what I'm talking about. It's fine to do it when you're young, but unless you're in, uh, unless you're the general manager or something like that, and you can offload your workload to others, the young ones, it just burns you right out. Because you've got to be up before the guests and you can't get to sleep before the guests. So you're running on a very short sort of sleep pattern and the stress is crazy. That cap is not encroaching the solar pad of another cap, is it by the screen connector? by the seashore uh, these are actually that's common rail there this whole this whole section here is common rail but you are right it's getting very close it actually isn't touching but it is blooming close so uh, thanks for pointing that out I think the worst nights I had with the uh, game parks were when we found out that the tape backups weren't working for their uh, Fidelio netware servers and we had to drive into, we had to race out at the middle of the night back towards the main town that was in the Palanisburg area where they were holding the tapes in a vault and we had to go back I think it was seven days to pick up new tape, uh, tapes that actually had valid data on them and, was, uh, and we had to do that all through the night because we need to have the guests ready to check out in the morning And of course, when you when the guests wake up, they're like, "Oh, hello!" And you like, "Go, oh, hi! Everything's okay." Even though we just spent all night without sleep, fixing up a computer stuff up. The entire entertainment industry has been out city. It pretty much is, isn't it? Yes. My most memorable stuff up probably was bringing down the Michelangelo in Santon, which is a five-star hotel, on a Saturday morning when people were checking out. That was fun. That was fun. The Michelangelo was a very prestigious, well, still is, I imagine, a prestigious hotel in the middle of the prestigious suburb and I brought it down to its knees. <laughs> it was like, oops, sorry. It wasn't even my fault really, it was fault of the electrician, but I got the blame for it anyway. I'm surprised they let me still work there. Yeah, JCD Palanisburg with, um, I worked at the Buckaboom and Kwamartani. I never got out to, they also had a five star, just sort of like, very specialized resort. I always forget the name of it. It was the name for um, Rhinoceros, damn it, can't remember anyway. Yeah, but all I was doing at the 
Michelangelo was just, I've got to get a fuse. I just need to plug in a new machine that would query the um, netware database. This is Novell netware, by the way, we're talking about, not, not Windows or anything like that. Anyway, I needed to query the netware database to see what rooms were available on a periodic basis. And I hadn't even turned on the machine. All I did was literally plugged in the cable, the power cable, and their whole system just shut down. And they had a fail-safe dual netware setup, server setup, and it all just came crashing down, and it would not come back. <laughs> I blame them for that. Or well, whoever set it up, they should have had it on redundant um, power supply rather than having it all on the same UPS. Yeah, that, that's my... Oh man, where are my fuses? Ah, oh, here we go. Uh, it was 312, I think. 312 or I think 315. We had TCP IP on it at that time. next closest thing I had was an almost stuff up and that was I was entertaining a person whom I had an interest in so I was distracted it was late at night we'd already had dinner at the nearby restaurant a restaurant called Gambetta's very good restaurant Italian genuinely Italian and dangerous at times Anyway, um, yeah, I was distracted, and over in countries like South Africa, you'll get all your equipment shipped with IEC cables that typically would have UK um, ends on it. So we can't use the UK end. You have to put the South African big chunky power connector on it. And believe me, those South African connectors, they can take a lot of power. So what you'd do is you'd cut off the UK end, and you'd just wire in the uh, South African end. Somehow or another, I didn't realize which end I was cutting on, and I cut in with my pocket knife the a live cable, and all of a sudden, just sparks just went poof everywhere, and that was in the server room, and we had a IBM AS400 system in there, and I've got to say, at least IBM did their job properly, and that system did not go crashing down. Other things did, but that one didn't. I was just running through the hallways desperately trying to check that uh, I wasn't going to get caught for this. I don't remember much of the rest of the night, but yeah, I do remember running around like a crazy madman, not really worried whether I was suffering any sort of burns or anything like that from nearly killing myself. What mattered to me was I didn't need a repeat of the Michelangelo. I still have that pocket knife and it's got a nice chunk missing out of the main blade. Michael Andrew is still posh today, is it? Oh, okay, cool. Hey, Christian. I shut down the whole store when I was 19, that was bad enough. Head tech, first actual build, done in ages, left the cable to the 80 power supply, sitting in front of the cable. Oh! Oh, yeah, okay. Nothing like a good short to bring, get the old um, breakers to kick in. Good job. Right of passage, right? Right of passage, yeah. You want to see the knife? Uh, I don't even know where it is. It's not anywhere here at the... It's in the shed. But it's a, it's a Swiss Army pocket knife, funnily enough, given to me by my ex fiance whom I was supposed to marry and then I sort of got cold feet and went for a run six weeks before the wedding date when everything had already been booked <laughs> oh god I was such a jerk as a young man anyway I don't like the look of that cap it's got damage on it I think it's gonna end up being a shorter cap well well I'll try to remember to bring the knife for the next talk session. Hey Jim, what are you doing up this late? 
Jim, have you got your new meds yet? You mentioned that you might be getting them today or something like that. Actually, it looks like it was just a bad end on the solder. Apartheid was a bad thing in South Africa. Yes, it was. And it was good that it had been resolved. But unfortunately, what has subsequently formed in South Africa in many ways isn't great either. It's certainly not the Rainbow Nation dream that people had hoped for. Some of it was because of unrealistic expectations. Some of it, well, a lot of it is because of pure greed, nothing more. Yeah, Joseph, uh, a little bit like that. At least I had the decency to cancel things prior to the actual date. Yeah, I wasn't... I was a jerk, but not a complete jerk. Uh, we've got many more things to still fix on this. Which means you're going to have to put up with me waffling on still. Okay, I was, um, I was 22, 22 when I was going to get married, and I sort of realised soon enough at least, quickly enough or early enough, take it as you will, that it wasn't really the right decision path to be taking at that time. And I think what made it hurt the most was the fact that it was more of a time thing, um, yeah, it's, yeah, that one, that one left its scars, that one really left scars for a very, very long time, in fact, right up until pretty much only six months ago. When you, sorry for getting philosophical and deep and emotional here, but sometimes when you make choices like that, even though you're the bad guy, it really does... You don't need to be punished by the other people because you carry that guilt and punishment for a very long time. Even if the other person's life turns out great because of what you did, which in this case is the situation. The, she ended up getting married exactly a year after the date that we were planning on getting married and she had a fantastic life. She's um, very happy with how things worked out. But that doesn't, that doesn't alleviate the guilt in many cases. So even when you do make the right choice, you can pay for it. Ooh, this live stream is taking a dark turn. Yeah, Joseph, I agree. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. And then it was only a few months later, I went off to Africa. And that was, for me, the uh, one of the best things I ever did in terms of... Unlike letting go of that cap, which was not a good thing to do. <laughs> letting go of that cap was a bad choice in life. Oh, and it doesn't matter anyway, because that cap's still there. Duh. Well, I guess it wasn't such a bad choice. Certainly, JCT, the um, equality has just shifted to new masters. I mean, in many ways, yeah, the power still rests with a lot of international type people. But I don't think, yeah, trying to get power redistribution and all that, that is a very hard thing to do. Particularly, like I said, if expectations are a little bit skewed. Okay, there's a lot of... You, know, you can't just throw new people into the job and expect everything to go right. 
and stuff like that. It's, it's a great big mess and I don't know how long it's going to take to resolve or if it ever will get resolved. Got the outline but it's somewhat broken. Can you test it your own? Um, I won't be able to do this machine but can you... I presume you've emailed that to me. And then I will have to do that. For those wondering, Damara is whom I'm incorrectly pronouncing. I do apologise, but I'm going to have to train myself to say your new your name properly. He is working on a um, Allegro binary BRD format conversion process, and we've had some pretty good success. Well, I should say he's had some pretty good success. And we found a couple of bugs on my side, but it's going well, which is great because there's a lot of I shouldn't say a lot. There's a few boards that you buy out there and they're listed as BRD files but they don't work on FlexBoard View or OpenBoard View because they are um, this Allegro Cadence binary database type form. And anyway, Damaris is helping us out by finding a way to convert them to GenCAD, and once it's in GenCAD, then a lot of us can use that. Just call him Dida. I might just call him Dida. <laughs> How's that Dida? He's probably like, oh god, give me back to Mara's. <laughs> was in the army, Rhodesia, and never regret going to Africa. It was a beautiful place. It is really a beautiful place, and I think that's the funny thing, you know, when they say you, once you go to Africa, once you live in Africa for a while, it's sort of, it's stuck in you, you can never really leave truly, and there's a great deal of truth to that, and I don't know exactly what it is, but it's definitely there. Mail sent, excellent. Mr. Ass. I don't think Mr. Ass is going to go down so well because that really is a little bit too close to one slur away from being misinterpreted and demonetizing myself. I mean, I was only there for four and a half years from 96. So, yeah, they just finally cleared the. You know, um, what is it? Uh, Mandela was, you know, president finally, and all that sort of stuff. And everybody was happy and hopeful. Great prospects ahead. You know, we've gotten rid of this, you know, apartheid and stuff like that. But unfortunately, by the time we got to around about 2000, it was getting pretty clear that things were not going quite as as intended. This should work as a. Now, this is my donor board that I sourced from the same place that has the dead CPU. Try pronouncing Denver Darby. Da da. Da da. Yeah, I think I'm going to need a lot more training. Da da. Andrew Hughes, was that for the war? Was he up in the north?
all right, North Africa right there. I was wondering about that. There was a good number of very unsuccessful campaigns up there, unfortunately. A lot of people not making it back home. I suppose it's relative. From the German side, it was successful for quite a while. Alright, what parts am I missing here? Is this one? Yes. No, Jesse, too, I didn't realize. Are you Irish? Why is it you poor bastards get so maligned in history? Oh, Rhodesian Light Infantry, right, okay. I will say this much though, the Irish certainly set up a good number of pubs in South Africa, that's for sure, or at least certainly a lot of influence there. It's been way, way too much money and time at those places. Well, at least I can now blame someone. I mean, there were plenty of English pubs there as well, but yeah, certainly I probably spent more time with the Irish ones. Uh, what else do I need to? I suppose I better. I better do this. Someone might want to actually capture me doing this. I am going to remove that JTAG. It's not badly damaged, but I'm removing it just simply out of abundance of caution. Let's see, let's see what the Dropbox tragic looks like. Ah, uh, oh, that's actually pretty good. That's a pretty good outline. I know what's going wrong there. I know what's wrong there. It's trying to draw. Uh, it's trying to draw the outline as segments rather than as a sequence. It's not something you can fix. It's something I have to sort out. But that's that's looking pretty good. And I think oh, either that or the curves are missing. It's not doing arcs. It's probably what it is. Not doing arcs. Yes, I know. Forgive me for I have removed a JTAG. I said it is not something I typically do. I don't believe in the unnecessary removal of JTAGs. I mean, if this board was born with that JTAG there, why should I needlessly cut it off? Actually, I don't know why I'm thinking of replace. I might just resolder that. And I suppose people will come back and say, well, see, the JTAG gets really dirty and it kills the board. But if you didn't get the board all filthy, then it wouldn't be a problem. Alright, we're still going to do the backlight chip. Just realised this whole area is a... Oh my god, this board is really not worth the time I'm putting into it. It's more of a placeholder for me being here. I 
that it's just going to be a complete wipe. Now I've always been very anti JTAG removal, if not truly required. Lewis just went crazy with the power and just started taking JTAGs out even when they didn't need to be. But I had to, that, that one did have corrosion in it, that's the thing. It wasn't a lot, but it did have it, and one of the pads when I removed did have some eating away. So get rid of that cap, that one too. They look a bit dodgy, but they should be okay. There's some solid junk under that. Hopefully all the pads will be retained. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Ooh, that a burnout? I think we've lost one pad there. <sighs> uh, I think we lost that one. That is actually a nuisance, to say the least. It would have been better if that pad had died, because at least if that was the case, it doesn't... It's not ideal, but it's not a deal breaker. This one, I have to fix it up, because this one needs the power. It needs the power. So it looks like we're going to have to do some actual work. Ah, this is not what I do this job for. I don't do it for the work. I do it for the fame. Okay, and that backlight feedback pad almost got chewed out. Fortunately, there's enough there. We don't really need to fix it. It'll be okay. Yeah, this one, we're going to have to fix. What a pain. Oh, I'll just run a wire straight across, but it's still a pain. stuck on that. So I'm just having to adjust the um, eyepieces because because it's night and it's a bit later my eyes are the focus isn't the same as it is during the daylight when I have slightly more capacity to focus. Alright. Jim, I'm sorry, I, I should have been checking before, but um, how did you go with your meds? I'm sorry, I know I asked and I probably missed you responding and I apologise.
by the way anybody watching this video worth their salt as a technician there's no need to tell me that this is not worth doing because I'm well aware of it in terms of time invested this board is never going to give me back what I put into it now but it's sometimes you just like to do these things for a skill builder yeah what is the time it's nearly two o'clock in the morning Come to think of it, maybe a, this double fold is a bit too excessive for what I'm doing. Night one of the new meds, gradually increasing dose. In the meantime, more I think morphine to drop the thing. Uh, blah, 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 bone pain. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully tomorrow things will start looking up for you. I know it's always a bit of a nightmare trying out the new stuff. Ah, crikey, someone forgot to put flux down. Nuts and proud, I have to go for a walk. The old incontinent rescue dog. Oh, okay. Well, enjoy the walk. Sorry about the dog, as in health wise. Hopefully, hopefully it's managed. Now, the real problem here is that. Um, when we put the new chip down, it's really going to have fun squeezing the balls in. Hey Ed boss. What I'm hoping is that the excess solder that this wire has taken up will flood into where the pad is. And so we shouldn't see too much protrusion out. Okay, we'll get ourselves an LP8550. I'm going to get lazy here and I'm going to use a standard one as opposed to a genuine MacBook one. The difference being is that the standard ones, when you do a change in the brightness, they would do it as a step, whereas the MacBook ones would do it as a transition. Fortunately, to date, I have never encountered a person who actually notices that as a user. P 
doing off? What are you linking in there? What YouTube video is that? Got to keep an eye on what PNL posts up. Oh, great. Do you know what, what was that that you tried to link? Because it doesn't come up on this site. Copy link address. Paste. That's weird. It doesn't come up here. Oh well. I'll solve it later. Hey, our crafts. Good day to you too, sir. Actually, that's a bit presumptuous of me. I've never asked if you were actually male or female. I guess that didn't really matter to me. Oh, uh, the video Pionov is linked as how to make it go to be using the, um, what do you call it, the transition mode rather than the step. Right, I'm guessing that's what it is. are getting to the point where I'm having trouble. I'm actually having to look at the screen in order to work out if I'm in focus properly. That's not a good thing. I mean, how am I supposed to watch Criminal Minds and know what's going on? There are that's on. Yeah, I agree, Joseph, it is time to FO. You got Sonya in here, don't forget. Alright, those balls look pretty good. Now the real trick's gonna be what does it look like on the other side where we had that wire come through? Okay, so as so long as the substrate isn't conductive, we should be okay. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. What else? Ah, oh, man. Now the SMC. Seriously? Ah, oh, and the clock chip. <laughs> this just doesn't end, does it? Okay, we'll fix up the clock chip and then we'll go back and clean up the resistors and stuff around the SMC. actually came off cleaner than I thought. I was genuinely expecting some sort of corrosion based on what I could see on the right hand side there but it seems it was not the case. Afternoon Keith. Some people are learning more about languages in channel than board repair which is good. I got no problem with that by the way.
Uh, when it comes to time in South Africa, I think the hardest thing for most people when they get there is to understand the terminology is used for just how quickly things are going to get done. Things like now versus now now versus just now versus yeah. There's so many subtle variants and they're usually longer than what you're expecting. Once again, I'm out of clock chips. Come on, give me a clock chip. That's not a clock chip. That's a that's a disaster. Uh, and that's a beautiful clock chip. We'll use this one. It is actually very beautiful. Yes, now, now, it'll be done just now. Uh, Shady Hacker, yes, I am a business. I trade as a sole trader, which makes tax matters very simple I mean legitimately simple uh, you essentially as long as you keep all your receipts keep track of your expenses all that sort of stuff don't try any funky funky but like, you know hiding cash and things like that then when it comes end of year well every three months I have to report my income versus my expenses sort of to report GST and then yeah after 12 months I, all I've simply got to do is say I earned this much I paid this much and that's essentially that I don't have to do any complicated accounting I do have to pay what we call pay-as-you-go income tax which means every three months the tax department will ask for income tax based on your earnings and how much tax you paid the year before so it's a bit of an estimate it is... Oh, I've got a cough, sorry it can seem like a rather great inconvenience to be having to pay pay as you, G, pay as you go income tax but realistically it's the tax department trying their best to not let you become your own worst enemy because if you don't pay your income tax um, in quarterly lots then come end of year if you've had a decent year you've probably already spent that income tax and then you've got to pay it back and that's quite painful I wouldn't say Australia is a tough place to do business the tax department's a lot less brutal than say I think what the IRS is in America it depends on what business you're gonna go as you know like I said sole trader is very easy the downside of sole trader is that you take on a lot of personal liability and you can't minimize your tax quite as well as you can perhaps as a company structure. The biggest problem I'd say with Australia is that if you do things like payroll, the cost of hiring people and your responsibilities as an employer are quite extensive. And that does tend to sour the mood so far as wanting to get involved in business. Often what will happen to bypass a lot of that sort of stuff, many small medium places or partnerships will 
instead of hiring people as employees, they will try to get those people to form up as their own sole trader and then they will subcontract them rather than employing them. It's a bit naughty and certainly a lot of people have been caught out doing that when they should be employing people. But it is more of an illustration that there is a problem with the system of employment and there's a little bit too much um, there's a little bit too much burden on the employer these days so far as their responsibilities towards the employee now I know I'm not going to be very popular here but even though I'm generally not a right leaning voter I will say that I actually was disappointed to see the termination of work choices by the Gillard government, uh, or not Gillard, um, what was his name, Rudd. When they ripped that up I thought, you know, I know you did that because you that was one of your main focus pieces for winning the election, but I think it actually harms the ability for businesses to be able to more rapidly or more openly employ people because now they're going to be apprehensive about taking on staff because there's an incredible amount of liabilities and you can't just offload people if they're boat anchors. So we call that a 1099, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Barry, it's, like I said, it's, in my opinion, it's more a reflection on the pain, the, what we consider excess pain involved in having employees. I mean, the fact that you can't just, I understand also that, you know, employers have to be protected, but we do have already systems in place for that there already was or were legal avenues in order to get your recourse as it were if you were unfairly dismissed but now it's incredibly hard to be able to drop someone who is dragging your business down you have to go through a whole lot of stuff to get rid of them and they can always just uh, it's just difficult and it makes you sort of go you know what I'm not going to employ staff, I'm just going to find my way of getting around that and stay as a partnership or stay as a sole trader. Well, you see, Joseph, it, I guess it's a matter of perspective. I mean, you're going to have bad employers doing bad things to staff. There's that one view. But then there's also the view that you've got bad staff dragging down good businesses so and I always thought that there already were legal protections for the employers are uh, the employees in the existing system needs to say it it has resulted at least in my limited view it has resulted in businesses being disinclined to employ staff especially full-time it's sort of like well if we we're going to do our best to just keep you as either subcontractor or as part-time it's ludicrously expensive to have employees and like i said legally it's quite terrifying what you have to deal with but yeah yeah on the upside, it has, however, somewhat created a very fast-growing small business sector in Australia. Because, you know, people weren't able to now get jobs perhaps as easy as they could before. 
and so now we have a lot more people going well you know what I'm going to give it a shot myself and go at it my own way and I suppose that's a positive outcome really and it's the sort of outcome you want you want people to sort of go I'm going to give it a shot myself Joseph, I guess it's a case of the pendulum swings forever seemingly too far. No one, it's uncool to be take a moderate approach anymore. It's like we've got to be either extreme one way or the other. You know, because people think it's sitting on the fence, but you know, it's not always sitting on the fence. Sometimes it's actual genuine, this is the middle ground where all things are acceptably fair. Oh, there was a comment way back um, with regards to the fact that the company in South Africa that I was employed by went belly up a year after they hit their highest year sort of thing uh, regarding you know that would have turned me off being employed and just you know better off doing things myself uh, I'm bringing that up because really from the age of about 15 I essentially was always working as a sole trader doing jobs myself under my own name and it was only the last whoops it was only about the last 12 months of my time in South Africa that I actually took on uh, my took on as a employee the rest of the time I was a contractor over there so for me most of the time I've always been a you know, self-employed contract type person I've always found it just easier to do it like that it's something that I found to be very natural Joseph one thing I'm finding or hearing that a lot of people are hurting from local businesses anyway is with the apprenticeship systems where but I suppose this has always been the case where they will be obligated to train up their staff, which is understandable, but then the staff have no obligation back to the business for that investment. And so you end up with these businesses that spend quite a lot of money training up staff or you know, getting them up to spec, and then the staff just simply get poached by other companies, and there's, there's no loyalty. It's like with Futurama, with the 80s guy, yeah, loyalty means for two dollars I beat you in the back of the head with a pool cue until you get detached, ret detached retinas. That essentially sums up what loyalty means. Because I know it costs these companies a lot of money, particularly with things like you know, mechanical uh, apprenticeships and things like that. It's a lot of money invested because obviously the staff, yeah, they'll make mistakes naturally and they have to be corrected. Okay, so I'm just sort of trying to remember which resistors I need to put. And yeah, that's par for the course, but it would be nice if there was a little bit of mutual um, respect and loyalty back towards the company.
not going to float the SMC. My gut, man. Actually, I might have to because it did get junk under it. Now, remember, this board was actually working. I am fixing a board that already works. And I might actually take the edge bonding off this and give it a bit of a push which is probably going to ruin it <laughs> now Tony let's not get ahead of ourselves too much even if it might well happen I'm kind of being a bit vigorous here with I'm using 460 on the temperature and really I'd normally do these at about 200 250 now the only problem I have with doing this sort of thing is that almost always when you chip off or away the edge bonding there's stuff left underneath and when you go to reflow the chip it doesn't go anywhere and all you end up doing is shearing some of the leaded, non leaded spheres, and subsequently you then have to reball it. Yeah, the SM uh, Gecko laughing. Apprenticeship should be government funded. I think, well, maybe, maybe up front funded a bit like university um, but I think yeah there should be a cost associated with it that the um, apprentice needs to pay back not so much to the business because I think yeah the business should just simply no wonder I was having trouble I was not using the reaper I think the business should be paid by the government to do the apprenticeship but the apprentice has to pay the government in turn for the opportunity to learn their apprenticeship. Like I said, much the same as with the university. I'm sure it probably is that way and I'm just not aware of it. Things change in 20 years. The only thing I worry about with universal income is the effect it will have of basically raising the prices of everything. The Futurama had a good episode on that, where everybody got $300 and all of a sudden everything goes up $300. Obviously that's a very crass and simple, simplified demonstration, but yeah, I mean, as, you, as people flush with higher numerical values of money, things tend to float up to match that. I did scrape check. You weren't watching. Yeah, that's reflowed. Sadly, as with all things in life, it's not always, you know, there's imperfect solutions. It's very hard to find a true perfect solution because in order for you to give someone $5 more, you've got to take $4.90 from someone else.
Let's see if I got myself a... Oh, I do. Yay. I doubt it's a crack in the oscillator. I would say it's probably just a itty bitty bit of junk. I don't think I've ever seen an oscillator with a legitimate physical crack through it like that. Uh, let's see, I need my 1466 chassis and I need a 1466 uh, one or two screws like this one here. I would like to see more efforts put towards simplifying the tax code. At this point it's sort of at this point it's more like my software where you've got so many duplicate functions and stuff like that and wasteful portions that are outdated and need updating. I mean it's not easy to update tax code but I think an effort needs to be made to simplify it because it is getting rather convoluted at this point. I mean the fact that the tax code book is like yeah this thick it's ridiculous. Where is my... Uh, what are you? I got a 1466 here that I don't recognize. It's one of mine, but I don't recognize it. Ah. Okay, come on. Give me a 1466 screen plus... Where is my test chassis? Nope, not you. Is that you over there? Oh, I've got too many computers on the floor around here. Need more shelf space. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I think I've got about seven different MacBooks on the floor. They're mine, but I don't put customer ones on the floor. They're mine, but um, I need to sort them out. I'm not too sure how well that screen connector is going to go because it is basically trying to fight through a bunch of flux there. So it may not actually come up properly. We've got the essentials. Let's see here we go. I do wish the Australian dollar would actually stop being so strong right now. Considering we're a country that likes to export things because we're too frickin lazy and got egos that says we can't be blue collar workers anymore so we just you know send all our manufacturing offshore and then complain that we're not having jobs in Australia but anyway um, damn it I lost my, <laughs> I lost my um, train of thought damn it Oh yeah, but the Australian dollar is just way too strong at the moment. I think it should really sit at around about 65 at the most. But, you know, we floated the dollar and that's the game we play. So, you know, all the choices you make have um, implications, yeah, have consequences, good and bad. Oh, we've got a bong and a screen energize. Did we get a backlight? I didn't even bother to check to see if the backlight... Um, yeah, I think we don't... Ah, uh, we don't have a backlight. Alright. Five internet points for telling me why I don't have a backlight. No, actually, I've got it wrong too. I thought I was being smart, but I'm not. Okay, I don't know why we don't have a backlight. Hey, 
It could be that the feedback trace is dead. I did have image on screen, so the screen is being detected, data is being sent, but we just have no backlight. Now I'm just wondering, was there something obvious that I ever looked? Apart from a god-awful flux infestation there. Alright, so if it is a feedback trace, even though it's on the opposing side of the board, we can still test it. So someone wants to say the fuse. Now, fuse was my first thought, but then I realised I actually did put a new fuse in there, and it is the correct type, it is the P-fuse. And yeah, so that fuse is fine. No troubles there. Okay, so what we're going to do is we'll check the backlight value. Well, basically here, we'll do fine. Give it a bit of a squeeze. So 0.57 we're reading. And then we'll see if we get similar values on this side. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, now it's blatantly obvious. See there? That, that's what's going on. We don't have, those are feedback test pad traces, and they don't exist. So stick out a little probe under the LP5, uh, 8550 and touch its little ball, and it's open circuit. So we need to run a wire to bring that trace through. And that is why it went wrong. Yeah, there's supposed to be gold contacts there, and there are not. All right, this is going to be fun. But, and by fun, I mean it's not going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be annoying. Uh, fortunately, because it is just a sense wire, it's not a current carrying wire. I can just use some of my preferred lids type wire. So some of this ultra fine stuff, it's not going to matter. If it was a current carrying wire, then I would have to you know, beef it up, but not this stuff. The nubs aren't going to matter in this case because it's actually disconnected internally, so the corrosion has gone through. Wow, that um, that wire is actually amazingly not taking. Ah, Niemann it broke it. Normally I have no trouble whatsoever. You've seen me use this wire plenty of times before and it never gives me that sort of difficulty in shedding its insulation. Now the reason why this is going to be fun is because basically I have to scratch away that slight nub because I'm too lazy to take the chip off. Which means I'm going to have to get a new blade. Which means I'm going to have to find the box that contains the blades. 
<laughs> Why am I so disorganized? It doesn't matter how much pain I endure, I just persist with being a disorganized little narc. Oh, come on! I had it like right behind me here where I wasn't looking. Found it. And as at this point I realized that the blades aren't even in the box, they're over here right next to me. Try not to bifurcate my fingertip. At least if you have an extremely sharp tip like this, you have a chance. If you try to do this with a blunt blade, or even a blade that's a day or two old, it probably will not work. And that's all the solder I need on there because I am going to separately tin this wire at a different location and then bring it across. First I've got to just gauge my distances. So I'm going to say around about there. And that's about it. But you know I've got to touch it again, don't you? You know I can't help myself. You know I want to touch that again. I feel like maybe it's not quite soldered properly. Touch it, touch it, touch it. Still doesn't feel perfect. Shut up, Barry. Shut up, Barry. OCD helps sometimes. You never know. I could be right here. Ah, oh, made it worse. It doesn't look as pretty now. In fact, it looks terrible. Can't help it, Travis. You're the one that gets pedantic about so many things. Don't you start lecturing me on being pedantic. Or not. That resistor on the other hand looks awful. That one on the top right. Yeah, that, that resistor needs intervention. Oh, 
Oh, look at it. It's missing half of its end cap there. Oh wow, the whole pad was corroded underneath. Uh... Great, where does this pad go to? Time to bring out the board view. Oh, you lousy son of a... Oh boy, I hope I can find the, um, yeah, that, that's not one that I wanted. Let us hope that there is a stalk there. And there is. careful that I don't destroy it. Try to clean things up. That was quite fortunate. I think um, I think I have chased those test point nubs before. Okay, I'm gonna have to just be happy with that little blob of solder there. It's not the best, but it's certainly it's tolerable. Those resistors look complete shite. That one looks much prettier. I'm going to have to title this stream A Way to Waste Your Life for a $200 board. Now don't, don't get all upset and shocked if that beautiful OCD wire comes free. I actually think it reflowed into a slightly better position. Yeah, I'm happy with it now that it's reflowed. <laughs> oh crikey, I forgot the input caps on that. Oh wow, yep. And this folks is why you shouldn't work late. Or at least not too much anyway. Yeah. Okay, we've got that triple stack there. We need two of them.
focus is definitely getting hard for me to find at the moment. I deliberately pushed that down quickly, didn't give it a chance to reflow. It's suffering a bit of pillow in head syndrome, but that's easy to fix with a soldering iron tip. This the bottom pad here of the large cap that's got pillow in head syndrome. It's not fully pillow in head, but it's close. It's sort of like slightly smothered. And now it's fixed. Usually you get pillow in head more with when you're doing solder paste stenciling and you pick and place the parts and the flux takes a runner before the board gets up to temperature for the part and then when actually reflow temperature arrives there's no flux to allow things to come together. Now hopefully that my reflow didn't make the enamel come off that. Check L5001, um, why would we need to check that? It should be okay. If it doesn't work then I'll go and check it, but at the moment I think it should be okay. We didn't have our continuity. It was looking good on the top side, but it was no good on the bottom side. Maybe it was a mistake using wire as thin as what I did use for that uh, feedback line. It's exceptionally delicate. You sort of need to protect it with a good chunk of hot glue sometimes. Anyway. I think it's missing. Oh. We'll find out. Yeah, maybe you're right. <laughs> nope, something's burning. I smelt something burning. Oh, you mean around the SMC? Yeah, I just realised that's what you meant. I thought I did move that across, but you're probably right. I probably didn't. Uh, yeah, I definitely smelled something burning then. Kind of curious that it would even boot with that uh, L5001 missing. Like I said I'm almost certain I smelt that something burning. Yeah, back to uh, yeah, too right. Good call there. Good call. That was smart. I blame the person who told me to reflow the SMC for distracting me from the purpose that I had. 
and the associated cap of course is not there either that was less of an issue yeah without L5001 we're not going to go very far I'm actually impressed it booted Steve K, where's the fun in that? I've only got customers in the morning, what do I care? By the way, if this was a customer's machine, I would not be working on it at this point. But because it's one of my own boards that I picked up for 15 bucks, that's why I'm at it. If you work on custom machines at this sort of state of incompetence at this time of the night, then yeah, it probably is not a good idea. As I was fairly sure I could smell something burning, but maybe it was my imagination. So there's a lot of other things that are probably wrong with this board that could be burning as well. It's three o'clock, so three and a half hours before sunrise here. I'm just going to test the diode mode at that point. It should be around about 0 0.5, 7, 0 0.6, something like that. That's way too low. Yeah, 0 0.19, that's disturbingly low. That's not good. So something definitely got toasty. Yeah, chip died. Kind of curious as to why I did that though. What we'll do now is we'll test the pad and then we'll test the end of the feedback line and you know what it could be no it makes no sense because i measured it okay i'm i'm going around in circles here i'm just going to measure and then we'll make an assessment okay the chips 0.18 also point what that's like it reeve connected or something what all right clearly I'm losing my marbles at this point point one nine So apparently I um, don't need a feedback trace wire. Maybe I had junk on my tip. Maybe I had junk on my tip and I never had to run that trace at all. It's 
kind of crazy. But if I'm 0.19 it on this side, although no, it'll, it'll be the driver. Time to take the chip off. Maybe the wire got damaged and made contact with something, I'm not sure. But what is curious here is that we now actually have a diode mode reading on the backlight driver, whereas before we were only seeing, well, we were seeing open circuit. Maybe we just short killed our problem. By the way, I do not support or endorse short killers at all. I feel they kill more boards than what I ever will. curious now okay so we are back to open circuit that's very interesting and what about over on this side though we back to 0.7 or whatever it is point no now we're open on the oh Jesus should be 0.57 Okay, let's go to schematics. Hmm. Hey, you Damara, what are you doing up? Better not turn to a damn rabbit hole. Did I have that chip on the right orientation in the first place? Yeah, I did. Yep. a short to ground in fact it's quite the opposite it's open circuit now that's I mean that's open point one two from the fuse hmm wait that's the fuse blown fuse is blown Oh, that's bad news. Uh, fuse is blown, which means that's the universe's way of telling me I need to wrap it up for the night. This is turning an interesting one, so we'll try and tackle this tomorrow as well, just for fun. Okay, I'm out of here. Thank you all for sticking around. Enjoy the torture. I'll see you next time. See us.